essentially a solid hour on critical thinking. Uh, two 30 minute, uh, two separate 30 minute exams. One of them they call analyze an issue, and the other they call analyze an argument. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the difference of, of both of these. Um, before we get too far though, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to uh, how to conceive of an article um, and uh, what they'll be looking for in this portion of the exam. So this portion of the exam is not content specific. Does that make sense? So uh, in a way that's good, right? You, you, you don't have to brush up on mathematics or social science or something like that. Um, what they're asking you to write on and what they're asking you to analyze will be sort of everyday or relatively simple uh, kinds of arguments that don't require specific sorts of knowledge, right? So they're not going to ask you uh, some complicated medical question about cancer treatment that only a doctor could answer, right? So uh, what we're going to talk about today then are the general kinds of things that uh, arguments involve and the general ways in which arguments are evaluated. Right? So another word for analytical thinking is just critical. Right? So what they're looking for is can you put together an argument and can you take an argument apart and evaluate it. Okay? So again, the content is not the important thing and they give you a lot of examples you know, on their website and they're all over the place. They're letters to the editor, their arguments about whether we should increase the speed limit in town, uh, whether uh, the, uh, the polls about the President Obama's performance are uh, insightful. So, um, so you can't really study by studying content. You study by thinking about and practicing putting arguments together. So, uh, Let's talk a little bit about the differences between these two. Analyze an issue, you're going to have to put together your own argument. So they give you a topic area and they say, uh, analyze and present your own argument. They give you an argument about capital punishment. The last thing they're looking for is for you to go in and say, well, I'm really against capital punishment. My third cousin was executed unfairly because he was set up by his former business partner. Right? Uh, so that's really important to remember. Your focus on both uh, sections, obviously, is on arguments very generally, but here the focus is on the argument they give you. Okay? Does that make sense? The difference between these two? Here you're putting together your own argument and you're trying to uh, make a case that something should be uh, done or changed, implemented. And here you get the whole argument and you're pulling it apart and saying this part's good, this part's bad, um, this part is uh, you know, making a lot of assumptions here or it's really using uh, the information or the data in a, in a selective kind of way. Okay. So you get 30 minutes on each, and you know you would write a couple of paragraphs for sure about each. Uh, the most important thing, though, is that you get your thoughts together before you start writing. Okay? Get your thoughts together before you start writing. In the case of the second uh, component, analyze an argument, you want to make sure you uh, understand the argument before you start critiquing. Okay? I tell my intro to philosophy students, when we're dealing with really hard questions, I don't care what your opinion is until you can tell me what the argument is, right? You've got to understand it first. So you want to sketch out what is the argument, um, you know, what are the premises, what are the conclusions, uh, what's the information that the author to reach those conclusions. And then you can start to say, okay, this is relevant, this is not, this is good information. So any questions about that? Just very generally what the two tests are. So it's, in a way, uh, you know, I mean, your English and your writing skills are going to be a part of this. You, 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 uh, you want to write coherent sentences, you want to have good grammar and all that. But that's not what you're being judged on, essentially. What you're being judged on is your ability to 
construct an argument and you're really Okay? Yes, no, maybe so? All right, let's switch gears then and talk a little bit about what an argument is. Uh, what is an argument? verbal fight, right? If we're throwing plates, somebody might say, well, we're having an argument. But that's not what philosophers mean when they talk about arguments. It's not what's, on the test. what's an argument? Okay? It's a disagreement, or uh, it's got to be more than that, right? Because you and I could disagree on abortion, and we haven't had an argument. I say yay, you say nay. What's an argument entail? What do we have to have? Uh, good guess, but no, right? Emotions actually will be, um, in almost all cases, inappropriate reasons for an argument, right? So I could be feeling a lot of anger towards you, uh, but we're not having a philosophical argument. Good, that's actually a common misconception, right? that, that if you're feeling emotion, you're having an argument. And in our everyday language, that's fine. An argument is a conclusion based on premises or, or reasons, right? So every argument will have premises, okay? Or reasons. And every argument will have a conclusion. Where does information or data or considerations fall? In the premises or in the conclusion? So if I say Florida had 59 capital murders last year uh, and we should uh, ban capital punishment where does the information occur? 59 capital murders. It occurs in the premise, right? So the uh, premises will include information, uh, data, sometimes we call it, right? Uh, historical examples, right? And we use that to construct arguments. So, whether you're giving your own argument or whether you're analyzing the other person's argument, you've got to separate out the premise from the conclusion. Right? And you, you want to be clear about that, particularly when you're writing your own uh, essay. Right? You, you want to have a logical ordering of premise leading to a conclusion. Now, in everyday life and in newspapers, you listen to people uh, provide arguments for things, they'll often mix in their conclusion with their premises. It's not always clear what the conclusion is, right? And whether the premise is, is really a, a reason to believe the conclusion or not. So uh, technically, the, the conclusion can come at the beginning, it can come in the middle, it can come at the end. But when you're writing, I mean, it makes the most sense uh, to leave your, your conclusion for the end or preview it and then run through your argument and then give you a conclusion. So we separate out the reasons for believing X from the conclusion itself. And we'll, we'll take some examples if you want to go to the test and try this out. Okay, any questions about that? Now, are they going to give you good arguments? So, in this part of the test, are they going to give you First of all, they're not going to give you, I've already told you, they're not going to give you really complicated arguments that depend upon content which people generally uh, don't know uh, or have views on from common sense. Right? So they're not going to ask you, you know, what you think about the latest molecular theory in biology or something like that. Or they're not going to ask you complicated questions about the history of Zimbabwe. Right? People don't know that, and that's not what the test is meant to, to, to do. 
but they will give you arguments that have some good points and some bad points. But, I mean, obviously, if they gave you a very simplistic argument, all men are mortal, Socrates is, is uh, a man, so Socrates is mortal. Well, that's a pretty straight deductive argument. Right, so they're going to give you arguments that probably are a little sloppy or assume some things that, um, you know, that may not be um, uh, obvious or good things to assume. Right? So going in on that second part, you can be thinking, okay, so they're not going to get, it's probably not going to be a really crappy argument, right? And it's also probably not going to be bulletproof. So you want to be thinking, and we'll talk here obviously about the things that you should be considering as you go through the, the test. Okay, so um, what I want to do now is um, look at uh, some, some considerations about uh, the sorts of things you can be thinking about when you're analyzing an argument or constructing it yourself. And this comes from um, the Foundation for Critical Thinking. It's up on the web. Um, just type in analytic thinking uh, or critical thinking or more. But um, these people are pretty famous. They have these little books. They're actually pretty good. I give them to my students sometimes, you know, order uh, three hours. And they just give little summaries of what critical thinking is, what analytic thinking is, or how to write a persuasive uh, uh, argument. And uh, so that comes from uh, what's up on the screen now comes from. Foundation. They're, one of them is a developmental psychologist and the other is a, is a PhD. They're pretty reliable, um, pretty straightforward. Anyway, so they have this little handout on analytic reasoning and this is the, the core of the, uh, of the handout. And I thought it would be worthwhile to just go through this a little bit and then we'll take some examples from the GRE. Okay, so... Um, as you can see there, whenever we think, we think for a purpose and from within a, a particular point of view, right? So when you're writing or analyzing another argument, you want to be clear about what the purpose is. Now, on a test, there's kind of this meta purpose, right? The purpose of me writing this article is so I can get into grad school. <laughs> but, but, you know, you can sort of forget that, right? The, if they're trying to convince you that the speed limit should be raised, that's their purpose, right? or they're trying to convince you um, that capital punishment is immoral, right? So, uh, now, they won't always state their purpose very clearly. I mean, in real life, often we'll get into uh, disagreements with people and it's not even clear what their purpose is, right? And they may not even be aware of it. Okay? Um, but uh, when you're analyzing an issue or uh, writing an argument, you want to be clear about Purpose, right? And you want to be clear about your point of view. What does that mean, point of view? Within a point of view. So that all reasoning occurs within a point of view. It could mean something like that. It's a little bit broader than that, um, but that's a really good. It's a really good uh, attempt or guess. It's it, point of view has to do with the perspective from which you're writing. Okay, so it may have to do, for example, with your cultural perspective. Right. So we write most of what we write. For example, we write as modern. Uh, Americans living in a democratic free country. Right? That's a point of view. Now we take it for granted and in most cases it's not objectionable. I'm not going to object uh, to, uh, to somebody who's arguing about capital punishment by saying, well yeah, but really we should live in an undemocratic uh, fascist state. Right? Uh, but those are part of our point of view. Right? The idea, for example, that um, the government is justified by democratic voting or something. Right? Not, not, if you look at history, right, not everyone would have had that point of view. 
Some people live in societies that think that the government should be run by religion, by theocracies. And so their point of view is very different. Okay. Three is a big one, and on the exam, both in your own writing and when you're analyzing the, um, uh, the argument from, from some other one, you want to be aware of assumptions, right? What's an assumption? Uh, it's partly that. Good. It's partly what you think. If you are assuming something, you're taking it for granted. Okay? So, for example, if we're having a debate um, about the speed limit, I may assume that you think uh, that less traffic deaths are better than more traffic. Is that a safe assumption? Yeah, we'd want it, generally we'd want to say yes. But if we really, if our only goal, for example, was to decrease traffic deaths, we could just get rid of automobiles. Then we would have almost no deaths by automobile. Right? Now, so what other assumptions do we have about driving that are relevant to you know, debating speed limit? Well, one of them is we should be able to use cars, right? I mean, we don't want to give up cars totally, right? So we, so we may have one assumption that, that less deaths is better than more, but another assumption we, we have is that, well, but we have to drive sometimes, right? And, and we want to get some places within reason, within a reasonable amount of time, right? So um, assumptions can reveal a lot about the value of an argument. And when you're analyzing somebody else's argument, you always want to ask, what are they assuming? Right? And that'll be important on the exam. Some of the examples I look through you know, will have pretty blatant assumptions that not everyone's going to share, or that are questionable uh, you know, as they relate to the argument. OK, the third thing, or the fourth thing there is leading to implications and consequences. So how does your point of view and the things you assume help lead you to um, outcomes or consequences for implication? Uh, another big one here is um, using data facts and experiences. So in your own argument, you want to use some examples. You can use one big example, right? and sort of flesh it out, or you can lo use lots of smaller examples, but they'll be looking for that, right? Again, it's not content specific, so they're not gonna expect you to know a lot of really complicated facts, right? But they will expect you to use some experiences, experiences that we've all had, um, uh, or that may be relevant to or uh, useful for thinking about the argument at hand. Um, you have to be a little wary of personal experience. What's the fallacy or the problem with personal experience when you're making an argument about a general topic? Yeah, right? They're too much uh, focused on your point of view or your own narrow experience, right? So if you say, well, yeah, um, I met a couple of Fort Hayes Honor students, but they were really standoffish. So all Fort Hayes Honor students are kind of stuck up. Okay? Now, even if that's true, right? Even if even if my personal experience was true, which is not by the way, right? But I'm totally making that up. But even if it was true that my personal experience, we have to ask, is that uh, experience relevant? Is it broad enough to make a sweeping claim like uh, for all 48 students are stuck on this? Right? So experiences are good, but you have to be wary of personal experience, not extending it too far. And that's a really common mistake that we all make, but especially if we're trying to generalize our experience uh, onto uh, big issues changing laws, uh, you know, something to do with technology, right? So if you had one, like I had one really bad iPhone, it was a piece of crap. And I'm tempted to say, 
iPhones are pieces of crap. And to move from that one experience to a much broader claim about iPhones in general. Uh, information, uh, you know, just generally is, is um, going to be something they're looking for and telling relevant information from irrelevant information is going to be, you know, important and that's, that's really uh, can be hard to do. Um, but we use that data, facts, and experience to make judgments and inferences, um, and those are our conclusions, right? We make, we make judgments based on those, uh, those things. So in your own writing, in your own argument, you want to be clear about your particular conclusion, make sure it's relevant to the question, but also make sure it's um, that the premises lead to your conclusion. Uh, that you're not assuming too much or too little about the way you're using the information. Okay. Um, so one other key uh, component about information is whether it's accurate. Again, you can probably bring that up in your critique of the, um, the other person's uh, argument. Uh, but again, since it's not content specific, they're not going to expect you to know you know whether a specific piece of information is is, uh, is factual. Okay, um, based on concepts and theories, and so this is where we get uh, in, in, uh, important uh, considerations here about key concepts. So, in your argument and the argument that you're analyzing, you want to make sure, and this is this is really important that you're clear about the key concepts involved. Okay. And um, unfortunately, in English and most modern languages, we'll use words, single words, in multiply and sometimes contradictory kinds of ways. So, uh, so the word bad, what does the word bad mean? Something negative, good, so it could mean something. in modern parlance, now, you know, bad is good. Right? When I was uh, growing up, if you said something was bad, I think it was good. Right? Wait a minute, how bad is bad? Right? So we want to be careful when we construct arguments and when we evaluate arguments that our key concepts are as clear as they can be. Now, you only have 30 minutes, right? So you want to spend 25 of it defining only one key. Word. But you want to be clear, uh, as clear as you can, about the way you're using uh, key concepts and words, right? So if the topic has to do with information, what do we mean by information? Are we talking about technological information? Are we talking strictly about data in economics? Are we talking about anything that human beings can experience? Um, and then lastly here, um, or most second to last is, is based on concepts and theories and I don't think you have to worry about theories very broadly in this kind of an analysis they're not going to ask you you know within a particular theory of political power how should we proceed or something like that. Um, but uh, you are going to have to be thinking about what are the important concepts here uh, how might people view them differently uh, relative to the other? And lastly, to answer your question to solve a problem. And again, that, that just gets back to the start. What was the purpose of it? What's your purpose in, in, in uh, writing your essay? Okay. Yeah, that's a whole logic course in 10 minutes. Right? So, um, it's an awful lot. Uh, Questions or comments here? We'll, we'll take a, a few examples and see if we can make some sense of this here in a minute. But, but any any specific um, comments or questions here that come to your mind? Okay. Which one do you want to do first? Do you want to analyze somebody else's argument or create your own? Okay. So we'll look at the uh, analyzing argument. 
So they give you um, a pool of topics. appeared in a letter from a homeowner to a friend. Of the two leading real estate firms in our town, Adams and Fitch, Adams is clearly superior. Adams has 40 real estate agents, in contrast, Fitch has 25, many of whom work only part-time. Moreover, Adams' revenue last year was twice as high as that of Fitch and included home sales that averaged 168,000 compared to Fitch's 100. Homes listed with Adams sell faster as well. Ten years ago, I listed my home with Fitch, and it took more than four months to sell. Last year, when I sold another home, I listed it with Adams, and it took only one month. Thus, if you want to sell your home quickly at a good price, you should use Adams Real Estate. So that's the argument. Yeah, you're laughing. It's not the best argument, um, but it very clearly is an argument, right? It's not. She's not merely emoting. Or he's not merely emoting, right? Yay, Adams, boo. Right? She's giving reasons that she thinks, or he thinks, that, that should lead you to the conclusion. Write a response in which you examine the stated or unstated assumptions of the argument. Be sure to explain how the argument depends on these assumptions, what the implications are for the argument if these assumptions prove unwarranted. So, let's go back here. First thing you should do, I think, is identify the conclusion. What's the conclusion of the argument? This one's pretty easy. Yeah, Adam's Realty is better if you want to sell your house, right? So, where does the uh, conclusion come in the argument here? It comes more than once. Beginning, middle, or end? Or some combination? The beginning, she says you're it comes, she comes, she does it twice, right? So she states it out front, which is actually a good way of arguing. I would say in your, um, when you analyze an issue, that's a good thing to do. State, you know, preview your conclusion and give your reasons at the same time. That's a very common, very common um, But uh, good, so, so this argument gives a conclusion at the beginning and at the end. And that's good. It could come right in the middle, though. I haven't looked through all these examples yet, but, it, but it's possible that it could come right in the middle of the paragraph. Grammatically, there's no necessary order. Okay? Good. So I think you, you got all that correct. You can start out your analysis by saying the, uh, argument, uh, uh, the argument's conclusion is that Adam's realty is clearly superior. Good. What reasons... I mean, I think you all, some of you are snickering. We see that this is not the best argument, but before you get to the argument analysis, get the argument out there. What are the primary premises for believing that Adam's real estate is the best? Okay, good. What does that assume? It does, generally speaking, that more is better. That's an assumption. It's a very American assumption. <laughs> more is better, bigger houses, bigger cars, more money, right? But that's an assumption. You, is that true? Is more better? Not always. Not if you're talking about cancer. You got more cancer in your body or less. Right? So the assumption there very clearly is that more is better. And we're already jumping to evaluation because that is so obvious, right? But good, let's go back to the premises. So it has more agents. What else is a premise? Okay, good. Revenue is higher. What else? Okay, good. So what was it called? Real, what's a realty firm? Oh, Adams is better. So Adams Realty has more agents. That's premise one. Premise two is Adams Realty uh, sells faster, is that what it was? No. Yeah, sells faster. Sells houses faster. Good. What is premise three? They have higher revenue. Okay, 
okay, has higher revenue. What else? Anything else? Oh yeah, has more agents and more full-time agents. So we could add that, or you could list it as a second. I think it's a good idea to see how quickly I, you could put those up there. Just in your notes, right? You could just very quickly write out those premises. You could even do them in shorthand so you know what they are. Okay? You got it. That's the argument. Now, right? And so the conclusion is, sorry, I should that there. The conclusion is Adam's Realty is superior. Or, if you're looking at an implication, you should hire Adams Realty. It seems like the purpose of this argument is to persuade somebody maybe who's thinking about selling their house to do that. Okay? Good. Any questions about just getting the argument out there? Now, if you take five minutes and do that, your evaluation's going to be so much better, right? Because you can start with, here's the conclusion. The argument offers three or four interconnected uh, premises for this conclusion. And you could say each one of them sucks, <laughs> right? Or each one of them But you could say each one of them has problems, okay? The first one we already found out one problem with is that it assumes that more agents is better. Why might more agents not be better? Yeah, maybe the reason they hire so many is that they don't work very hard. Or they hire so many because a lot of them are, uh, you know, slackers. Or they hire so many because what they're interested in is having a really big firm and they don't really care about anything else. So they hire a lot of people needlessly. What about the second half of that? More full-time agents. What does that assume? Full-time realty of agents. Why does she assume or he assume that that's a bad Yeah, so we think that people who are full-time are somehow more committed or more professional or something like that, but those are assumptions, right? Just becomes, just because someone is not full-time does not mean they're not qualified, it doesn't mean they're hardworking, they're not hardworking, it doesn't mean that they're not good okay. Um, premise two. Uh, Adam's Realty sells houses faster. What does it assume? Yes. Is that true? Is selling your house faster better than selling it slower? Well, if all things are being equal, that might be true. Unless, for example, you can't move into your new house for six months. Then selling your house faster is not a priority. Okay? But it, it, it assumes more than that, right? So it, it usually assumes that faster is better and things are not equal, right? And so what we want to worry about not only is that the house sells in a reasonable amount of time, but that it sells for a good price, okay? Or it sells to somebody, you might be interested in making sure that the person who buys it is going to keep it up, right? keep the house up. Maybe it was your parents' house or something. You don't want to sell it to somebody who's going to rent it, rent it out. Good. So it assumes that selling houses faster is better, and that it uh, though that that the speed of the sale is 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 really important. And it's not always important. It's certainly not the only consideration. Okay. Premise three uh, has higher revenue. What does that assume? That it's going to make you more money. But notice what other uh, what other facts in there also lead you to question that premise. Yeah, Adam's revenue was twice as high, but they have 40 real estate agents, and more of them are full time. And who knows? They may have been selling half a million dollar houses at below cost and suckering people into it, right? And so just because the number is higher, it makes no uh, 
uh, this argument makes no reference to, for example, what the taxed or assessed value of the house was. Are, are they selling houses for less than they're assessed for? Okay, so you get the idea here. You can poke holes in this left and right, and you would want to bring up these assumptions, and you would want to give some examples of the way that the argument assumes things that won't be true for everybody. Okay? And generally speaking, what does it get to? It gets to the problem of using personal experience, right? How, what's her sample size? Two! <laughs> A sample size of two is not very big. Um, yeah, sure, right? Yep. Ten years ago, that's great. So what happens in ten years? House values go up, right? The market might have collapsed as it did in the United States between here and ten years ago. It's totally relevant, right? So you used to be able to sell your house like that. Now it's much slower overall. So, yeah, so that gap is a very important uh, thing you, you could criticize the Okay, any questions about that one? Woo. Uh, should we do, do one more real quick and then we'll go to the other one? Okay, let's do Arctic deer. Arctic deer live on islands in Canada's Arctic regions. That's probably why they're called Arctic deer. They search for food by moving over ice from island to island during the course of the year. Their habitat is limited to areas warm enough to sustain the plants on which they, they feed and cold enough at least some of the year for the ice to cover the sea separating the islands, allowing the deer to travel over. Unfortunately, according to reports from local hunters, the deer populations are declining. Since these reports coincide with recent global warming trends that have caused the sea ice to melt, we can conclude that the purported decline in deer populations is the result of the deers being unable to follow their age-old migration patterns across the frozen sea. Right, in response to which you discuss what specific evidence is needed to evaluate the argument and explain how the evidence would weaken or strengthen the argument. So here this is a little bit more scientific or attempting to be a little bit more scientific and they're asking you what's the relevance of the evidence? What kind of evidence is it? What might it be missing? Or what other kinds of evidence would be relevant? Again, let's just very quickly, I won't write it up on the board, but what's the conclusion? This is easy, it gives you a really big conclusion indica indicator. Yes, thank you, good. So sometimes they'll even, that those are, in logic, we call those conclusion indicators. Therefore, hence, we conclude, in summation, right? Those give you hints that what's coming next is the so the conclusion is that uh, um, the uh, global warming has caused deer populations, or will cause deer populations, to Arctic deer. Okay. Good. What are the reasons for believing this? What are the premises? You can just sort of say them in your own words if you want. Okay, good. So there are reports from hunters that the, um, the numbers of deer are declining. What else? So we have reports. Premise one, what else? How does global warming fit in? What's that? Yeah, right? So global warming is known to cause ice melting and ice melting would prevent the deer from doing what? Yeah, crossing the sea and getting to these other islands. Therefore, global warming is likely to cause the population. Okay, so you can set out, there's probably another premise you can tease out there if you want it, but, but that's basically the argument. What can we say? So let's shift, then, then you want to think, okay, let's get it out, get the conclusion out there, get those premises out there. New paragraph, I would say, right? New paragraph, what's the evaluation? So what are some uh, things we might say about this claim? This, uh, uh, this claim that deer populations are declining because of what? 
Notice, it's not outrageous, right? They're not saying Martians were seen in San Antonio, and that's why deer populations in the Arctic are, are declining, right? I mean, it seems, re or it seems like it could be possible. But what are some of the problems with the evidence given? And I would take it premise by premise. First premise, reports from hunters. <laughs> yeah, how many hunters? Two? Your brother-in-law and his hunting partner, right? Or something like that. Right, so first of all, in order to evaluate this, we're, we're gonna know, we, ha we need to know more about, really, are the, if they're only going to the same island at the same time of the year, maybe they only go every other year, and then they go to different islands and they just never see any deer, because they're bad hunters or they would have drinking, right? That's a good explanation for why they're not seeing deer. Right? So we want to know, are deer populations really declining? And, and without knowing that, of course, you don't get, it, get very far. What else can we say? So we probably are getting to a point where it would be hard to say that that's not happening. What we don't know is whether that's happening here, what time of year it's happening, whether it's bad enough in the areas where the deer are feeding and at, uh, in large enough you know, geographical regions that the deer are not able to move and that the um, uh, populations, if they're declining, are declining because of so again, I think you probably want to say something like, you know, it may be true that global warming does cause, um, uh, in general, uh, some ice to be melting at high rates or places where we never used to see it, but that's too general, right? It assumes that that's uniform, right? That's happening everywhere at the same pace. It, it assumes that it's uh, bad enough that it's affecting this region um, enough so uh, um, if I were rating this this one is, is uh, uh, it's really bad because it's just based on reports of so scientifically until we really know the population Questions, comments, does that kind of make sense? All right, let's shift gears and look at constructing your own argument. So we can go back here. And I don't know why they call this issue. I guess maybe just not to confuse you. But basically they're asking now for you to take an issue and create an argument. Uh, let's look at this one. To understand the most important characteristics of a society, one must study its major cities. Write a response in which you discuss the extent to which you agree or disagree with the statement and explain your reasoning for the position you take. In developing and supporting your position, you should consider ways in which the statement might or might not hold true and explain how these considerations shape your position. Okay? So notice, I mean, just looking at it, the long part is explaining what you're supposed to do rather than giving you a bunch of facts and, and reasons and arguments because it's just a really general statement. Here are some other really general, just so you get a sense of how broad these are. Educational students have a responsibility to dissuade students from pursuing fields of study in which they are unlikely to succeed. Let's see some other ones. Governments must ensure that their major cities receive financial support they need. A nation should require all of its students to study the same national curriculum until they enter college. In any field of endeavor, it is impossible to make a significant contribution without first being strongly influenced by past achievements. Nations should pass laws to preserve any remaining wilderness areas in the natural state, even if these areas could be developed. Okay, so you get a sense these are these are really general sorts of claims, and they can be taken lots of different. And that's the way they're aimed, right? The purpose is to get you thinking very gently. Okay, so where did that go? Oh my gosh, 
People's behavior is largely determined by forces not of their own. Okay. To understand, is this it, right? To understand the most important characteristics of a society, one must study its makers. So they're asking you to construct an argument here. Um, and then, uh, or to reach a conclusion and to construct an argument that supports that conclusion. So, what should you do? Should the first thing you do be to take a position and then make some stuff up? Or should you, well, what should you do? You can tell by the way I said that, but that's not what you should be doing, right? Do you you got to be careful not to jump in on a conclusion you know, it's from some gut instinct, and then just start writing. What's what? What might happen if you do that? Yeah, you you really don't know. I mean, you just have this instinct, and so you just start coming up with things, and it feels good to write because everyone else is writing. But if you're just coming up with these various things, you may not even know whether in the end they they provide that much support for for what you had originally. So you want to be careful about jumping in. I would suggest, you know, take a take literally take five minutes to say, okay, let me think of every reason for this statement and every reason against this statement. That might be a good thing to do. Or think about, okay, what are the major considerations I might believe in this uh, statement or, or not? And then you can start to think about, okay, let's put this together. So you've heard it before, don't jump to conclusions. Right? That's, that's important. All right. Uh, to understand the most imp important characteristics of a society, one must study its major cities. So let's do that then. Let's think about what are some considerations that might make that statement true? What are some considerations that might make it false? What do you think? Good. So one reason for thinking that to learn about a society, you should learn about its cities, is because cities have a lot of people. Generally, we tend to think that. Good. Why, why else? What are some other considerations that you might think about? So out here in the middle of western Kansas, Hayes is considered a big city, right? And by geographic standards, it is a big -er city, right? Bigger than Victoria, but is it a big city? Well, it depends on your perspective, right? So first of all, we want to know what counts as a city, a major city, right? Is it just population? Is it maybe historical importance or something like that? And then also, we want to think about what are some other perspectives? So, small cities is another perspective. Rural areas is another perspective. Are there others? I don't know. It depends on whether you count suburbs as a, as a part of major cities or not. Uh, so on and so forth. It's probably different from one country to the next, right? So, so some countries may be all big city. Singapore, that's just one giant city, right? There are no rural areas in Singapore. Kansas, it's mostly rural. Some cities, but maybe not major cities. We wouldn't consider them major by nations. Good. What else can we think of uh, relative to this uh, claim here that might be worth thinking about? You can ask yourself, um, these kinds of questions too, right? What are the assumptions that uh, are involved? What are some key concepts? So we were talking about major. Major is a key word here. What does that mean? What, what does it assume? Or what does it, um, what are some different perspectives on the word major? Well, does major mean population-wise? Does it mean uh, historical significance? Does it mean Political power, right? Those are different ways in which we might define the word major. 
Good. What are some assumptions or um, other information that might be relevant here to this topic? Okay, good. So this assumes that major cities are importantly the same. Even if we could agree on what defines a major city, it may not be that they're relevantly similar. Okay. So, I mean, if you say, well, a major city is one where two million people are born. That's going to put uh, New York City in the United States the same category as Des Moines, Iowa. Is that a relevantly similar set of cities or set of grouping? It's going to tell us something useful about the important characteristics of society. What does that phrase mean, the important characteristics of society? Really broad. All right, so I mean, that's one of the things you're going to have to think about. These are really short, and so they're always going to, almost always going to involve some really big assumptions or really big claims that can be interpreted in lots of different ways. What might be some of the most important characteristics of society? If you could just would brainstorm that out, what, what, what might you be thinking about? Okay, good. So maybe. Uh, what they're thinking of is moral or political norms, ethical views, right? Good. Do people in cities have the same ethical views as people in the country? Mm, I don't know. Do people in the West Coast have the same ethical norms as people on the East Coast? Okay. So now you, you can start to get your, your, uh, get your teeth into the subject here. Uh, what are some other ways which you might understand important characteristics of society? So good, moral norms, maybe political norms, legal procedures. Good! So we might look at it through the lens of ethnic groups. We might look at it through the lens of religion. We might look at it through a socioeconomic view, right? How does the city function to represent what's going on economically in the country? Are the economics of a big city the same as the economics of a small town? Probably not. Maybe in some respects, right? We use the same currency, maybe. But a house in Hayes, Kansas that sells for $200,000, you put it in the middle of New York City and it would be worth $50 million. And they knock it down. I'm not kidding, right? So, so uh, we want to think about these things as we try and answer a question. Okay. So, what you would want to do is uh, talk about some of the assumptions here, talk about some of those key concepts and ways you might interpret them as you build your case. Right? No, there's no perfect answer, right? I mean, they write these in a way so that there's no easy perfect answer. So, don't. Your, your worry shouldn't be, am I making a foolproof case? There is no such thing. Is that, you you want to make a, the best case that you can. No case is going to be foolproof. Admitting your weaknesses or your assumptions is often a good thing. Okay? So you might start by saying something like, well, in order to really uh, map out an answer to this uh, question, I'm going to assume that the major important uh, categories we're looking at are ethnic, socioeconomic, and religious, or something. Right? And then give some reasons or some, some examples of what you need. Okay? Rather than just listing a bunch of things that come up randomly. Then, after you've kind of got the pros and cons, you can start to see well, what's my final position going to be, right? If you have eight things that are uh, misleading or wrong about the claim or make huge assumptions that probably aren't that, that valid, then you would want to say, look, uh, maybe I want to argue against this position, right? that focusing on 
big cities is not the way to understand culture. Make sense? Do I have more? Are we, do we go till nine or just eight? Yeah. Do you want to do another one? No. Did you do one more? Okay. Okay, this, this one's a little closer to home. A nation should require all of its students to study the same national curriculum until they enter college. Ooh, that's very relevant. Right now it's called Common Core. It's a big issue. All right, so that's a whopper of a topic. <laughs> um, what are some considerations, relevant considerations to this topic? Again, I don't think, don't start by saying, am I yes or am I no? I, I think the best thing to do at the beginning here is just come up with some ideas about what information is relevant, what is it assuming, what are the key concepts, what question uh, is at hand here, and trying to get a sense of it before you start writing. Good, so uh, what are some uh, concepts, assumptions, or information that are relevant to this issue? Okay, good. So uh, it's assuming that a, nat uh, a national curriculum will move students through at a similar pace and that that's possible and that it's desirable. Those are all really big assumptions. Good. What else? So um, uh, nations, it's, I mean, we want to be careful that we're not assuming that it's the United States. Does it say the United States? No, what does it say? A nation. Really vague, right? So any statements you make about the United States, of course, are from a perspective. Okay? Uh, a nation like uh, the United States has many minorities uh, and a dominant majority. Uh, a lot of other countries do not have. Some countries are very mono-ethnic and other countries are much more diverse. Than that. Good, so you want to watch the perspective that you answer and in here you could point out that the statement is extremely uh, vague and in many interpretations could be a huge overview. Are you saying that every country in, every, in, in the entire world should accept this? It's a big statement, right? Don't assume that they're talking about the United States if they don't say it. Right? Because if they don't say it, that, that, that would be you reading into the argument something that's not necessary. Okay. Uh, what else does it assume? There's something big at the end. Yeah! That, that everyone's going to go to college? Again, see, they're setting you up, right? They know you're from the United States. They know that a lot of you, or all of you, went to college, right? They're, they're wanting you to assume those things, or not wanting you. But that, it's a common trip up, right? Because you don't see your own perspective. You think, well, yeah, this makes sense. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute. Maybe sending everyone to college is not the best thing. Maybe we should send some people to technical school. Maybe some people shouldn't go to college at all. Maybe they're ready to get out into the workforce. Maybe um, there are training. The big new thing now is training programs, right? So you can get C++ certified without going to college. And a lot of employers could care less whether you have the degree. They want to know whether you can program C++. Program. So, uh, although college might be an important thing for you and for a lot of people, it's not necessarily good for everybody. Uh, what if your country doesn't have any colleges? This would be a bad idea, right? 
So in your answer, you could say, I'm going to narrow this down to speak primarily about the United States, right, where we have the infrastructure, we have a lot of public universities that people can afford. So however you uh, come down on the issue, you want to be uh, thinking about your perspective, thinking about the key concepts that are involved, uh, and the assumptions that they're making. Right? So it's an assumption that college is good. It's an assumption that most people should go to college. Those might be fine assumptions. But we want to be clear about them. Right? And so we might want to say that um, this is a good idea for students who come in prepared and who test well, you know, all the way through. But that maybe there isn't um, a, a single curriculum that could work. That maybe we want to have a second track for people who, uh, who come in behind or have no desire to work in college. But you, you want to, um, Relevant reasons for your, for your inclusion. Other comments or thoughts about this one? Now here's an interestingly different one. Look at, uh, let's look at this one. Uh, some people believe that government funding of the arts is necessary to ensure that the arts can flourish and be available to. Other people believe that government funding of the arts threatens the integrity of the So here, there is, uh, it's a single issue, right? But they're giving you competing perspectives. And then they're going to ask you to uh, choose right? and then explain the reason for your position. In developing and supporting your position, you should address both of the views presented. So there, that's a little more complex. They're asking you to respond to the position that you ultimately end up disagreeing with. And again, you can get a they're not there's no right answer here. What they're asking you to do is can you construct an argument on a general topic that um, you know, shows critical thinking and that also um, you know, sensitive to alternative views or alternative positions. And to give a thought about why your position is better. So this one, at least in format, is a little more complicated. What What do you think of when you think of this? What What could you do or what would you think about in terms of preparing an argument? Excellent question. I don't know. What counts as the arts? And so we would, we would want to clarify that. Right? So in your answer, you could say, for the purposes of this argument, I'm going to be talking about the major traditionally funded arts. You're not talking about live performance art involving talking about opera, maybe, uh, what else, art institutions, museums. But yeah, so art is a key concept here, right? And one, we would want some information and clarity. Good, what, what are some other thoughts you have about this one? Yeah, good. So uh, what kind of funding are we talking about? Are we talking about just giving them a blank check to do whatever they want? Are we talking about in the context of an educational program where we, they're going to have some follow-up, you know, something uh, that would help, help uh, students learn? 
good, really good. What else? Yeah, so we, we, we can, okay, yeah, good. So again, we have lots of questions about funding. Uh, I don't think you want to get too bogged down in the minutia of funding, right? So, so you don't want to spend 10 minutes writing on, uh, you know, is this going to be only for modern art? But you do want to know, yeah, what do we have in mind? What are the, the ways in which uh, we assume things about how the funding might be directed? Good. Again, are we going to write big checks that they, uh, you know, institutions are going to have government sponsored museums? Funding. It assumes that the arts are a good thing, right? Big assumption. Are the arts a good thing? Not everybody agrees with that. Um, how about the second half of it? Others believe that government funding of the arts threatens the integrity of the arts. Why, why might somebody believe that? So on the other side of your paper, right, or the other column, you could think of some reasons to believe that. Because remember, it's going to ask you, even if you don't agree with that, to, to say something. Okay, good, yeah. So funding usually comes with restrictions. And the restrictions might, for example, stunt or harm the growth of the arts. Can you think of an example? I mean, a hypothetical one, or a way in which government restriction might actually hurt the arts. Yeah, good. So what if we only fund the classics? Because we like the classics. And well, then no new theater will ever be done because there's no money for it, right? So judgments about the value of the arts have to be made if we're funding it, right? Unless you're going to have some kind of a lottery. I just wish you could have. That has its own problems, right? So um, that might be a reason to favor the, the uh, not, not having government funding. Good. What, what are some other considerations in which government funding might harm the arts? art on people who really have no business or desire or native interest in art. And rather than letting people discover it, for example, they're turned off by it. I think of this with respect to government funding of baseball. Okay, I might watch a game, but now I'm not going to because I know that I pay for the stadium. And I'm mad about that. So sometimes when you force people to use tax money for things they don't like, they end up not liking it when they might have otherwise liked it. Good. Can you think of any other reasons? That uh, government funding might threaten the integrity of the funds. Yeah, I, think, I can think of a lot of versions of the first um, comment that you brought up about the, uh, you know, having to make decisions. That, that, that can threaten artistic integrity, right? So we have to choose who the best movie producers are, who the best ballerinas, or in some sense, uh, make choices that may not reflect what the artists themselves or the, you know, the people who are experts in the So, so uh, fund it and stunt it at the same time. So, okay, so you've got some considerations on the left, some considerations on the right, and what they're asking is that you write an essay to defend one of those two positions, give some reasons, help clarify things, right? So the, the very first thing 
I think would be great would be to say something about what art you're talking about. For the purposes of this argument, I'm only considering the major traditionally funded arts, which are these. Or you can even be more narrow. You could say, this topic is so broad, I'm only going to focus on funding of, of the visual arts. Right? And in this case, I could see that government funding would be good. And then somewhere in there, you have to have a paragraph where you admit the other side has a point. That's what they're asking you to do here, right? See that last, that last thing? You should, in developing, supporting your position, you should address the views of the opposite position. So you've got to at least engage it. And you'll, you'll lose points if you just totally ignore the other side. Okay? So how could you do that? Well, you could say something like, there are those who are worried about um, the fact that money might stunt the integrity because it's making judgment calls about the value of different directors or different types of art. And I would fix that by having a council of art experts and ordinary people choose the, where the money's going to go rather than some anonymous person. Right? So, so in that sense, you admit that the position is a concern, but then you address a way to alleviate the concern, and then you then support your own argument for your side of the problem. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's a lot of stuff. I think, you know, um, what we did here is just really tiptoeing into the, the shallow end. What you ought to do, you know, if you're really serious about this, is take a couple of examples and just try to do it in 30 minutes. Let's see what it's like. Uh, the, um, the chart I had up there, and these, you know, uh, few things I put up on the board, you know, I wouldn't try to memorize that or anything, but but but, but it, it gets you thinking about the different components of what it means to argue. And so when you're making your own case, you can think a little bit about these things, and certainly while you're evaluating the argument of the other uh, person, you, there's going to be some problems, right? As we saw, two of the three arguments were really pretty bad. Right? And so you want to be thinking about all of the ways in which they might go wrong. In introductory logic, I mean, if you really want to do this, take intro logic. And that's what you do most of the semester, is just find out all the ways arguments go bad. And they go bad in a lot of different ways, very common. And so logic teaches you to recognize some of those fallacies. And some of those fallacies are in these examples. Small sample size, huge scientific using only personal experience. Um, so, I'm more than willing if you you know do some of these and you and you want some feedback, you can email them to me. Don't give in to that temptation because usually what that does is um, just cloud things. Right? So stick with words you know. Um, and strive for clarity. So um, when you use a word that can be used in many different ways, you want to specify in what way you mean. Right? The arts Ooh, can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. So clarify. In my argument, I'm going to be concerned with visual and that right there totally narrows down the scope of your argument, gives you a much higher chance of success. If you say, this is wrong, or this is bad, you need to clarify, right? In what? Is it morally wrong? Is it legally wrong? Ethically wrong? Religiously wrong? Practically speaking, it's wrong? Wrong because you feel it's wrong? Wrong because your mom felt it was wrong? There are all different ways people use the word wrong. 
So clarity is really important too, right? And um, the, the grammar and the, the organization of your essay is going to help or hurt, but um, in addition to you know just having paragraphs and transitions and all those things you already know, you want to you 